Thank you for tuning in to WDRB Media, the voice of the community. You're listening to Football Focus Weekly with CFI, and I'm your host, the Pet Man, Matt Morrow. You can find us on Twitter at Petman704, Instagram and Facebook at Charlotte Football Insiders, and on YouTube at Matt Morrow. Today's show is sponsored by Mies and Plus Collective. For all your food, consulting needs, and more, visit them at mepcollective.com. On today's show, we will be discussing 7-on-7 football culture, the best way to get recruited now in high school in 2024, the top 25 wide receivers in the Charlotte metro area, that's mine, those are my rankings, and the latest in college and NFL news, including discussion around NIL, uh, trying to get some regulations around it, and then we're going to talk about the Panthers. I got my Panthers jersey on, my Cam Newton jersey for multiple reasons, but <laughs> we're going to talk about Brian Burns. Well, what would you do? Would you pay him, trade him, tag him? What would you do if you were um, in the Panthers' shoes or Dan Morgan's uh, shoes as the general manager? Uh, but starting out today, uh, we're going to start with 7-on-7, seven seven, man. I mean, everyone's talking about what happened with uh, Cam Newton and – the uh, adults, <laughs> I put that in quotes, adults, that tried to um, attack him, basically, and um, over some some silly disputes. And, um, you know, I just want to kind of, if, if you're, you know, tuning in, you know, send us your comments. Let us know what your opinion is about, you know, 7-on-7 seven seven in general. But just to talk about, you know, that situation, first of all, um, if you're not familiar with seven on seven, it's what um, high school uh, players do in the off season. And um, I remember coaching a few years ago and it coming up to be um, a good thing. It kind of was, you know, tabbed as the AAU of um, high school football. And, you know, starting out, there were some good people um, that were involved in it. There were some great things locally here in Charlotte. I can remember NC Elite uh, with uh, Myron Bell um, having one of the better uh, seven on seven programs. And that has, you know, grown over time and changed um, locally. Carolina Stars are now known as a, a very good seven on seven program. Uh, but in general, um, it, just like anything else in life, there's good parts to it and there's bad parts to it. And the the bad thing is, you know, a lot of the toxic stuff in seven on seven, um, goes viral, um, for, for different reasons, but, um, that culture has developed, you know, these kind of things that occur and, you know, and this time it happened with Cam Newton, but, um, we've seen it happen. Like you go to any seven on seven tournament, there's going to be a lot of junk talking. There's a lot of, you know, showboating. Um, and you know, I really feel like it's the, the good ones get outshined by the toxic stuff, sadly. And I'm going to bring in uh coach. We call him coach dub, but Robert Washington, the head coach of mountain Island is here and joining the show. Coach dub. What's going hey. on, Pep? Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, not much, man. We're talking about this seven on seven thing with, um, you know, all the madness with Cam Newton. Um, do you encourage your players to participate in seven on seven in the off season? Not really, because um, they could be doing other sports. There's other sports you can do, like track and field. Go and do something else. I mean, you'll get to the football. We got a lot of um, summer workouts and stuff that we do that we'll get to the football, but you know, risk injury. And just continue to do that 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 football, football, football. It's not always a good thing. Um, it is beneficial for some athletes, like your quarterbacks, obviously getting ready to throw it. But it also creates a lot of bad habits. With you know, you don't have that much time. You got a line in front of you. You don't got a line in front of you in seven or seven. But um, the only thing you can really get out, from my opinion, out of seven or seven, is to see who co- who competes, who wants to compete, who's your dogs. That's it. But all the chipping, all the talking, that's not football. And um, I've seen it go downhill over the last couple of years because, like you said, Pep, 
it did start off as something that was positive, something to give up kids outlets. But now kids are choosing to go to these seven on sevens versus actually participating in their um, high school um, off season workouts. Yeah, and and that's another thing, you know. And and when it started out, you know, um, when 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 I was at Harding and it started out we kind of told the players to make sure you work it around, you know, your high school schedule or our schedule, I should say. And, you know, in the beginning it was a partnership, you know, but now it's like, and, and I want to get into this because going back to the Cam Newton thing, the, the, the coaches, once again, I'm using quotes, the coaches that attacked him because of the, all the junk talking, um, that's not setting an example you know, for these young men out here. And, that, and a lot of the problem with seven on seven culture is the adults or the so-called coaches. Um, that, I, I, I think a, a big, big problem, and I think I've said this before, is there's no regulation really over seven on seven at all. And when female um, girls flag football came uh, a big thing here in Charlotte where now all schools have teams, I said, I would love to see a male version of seven on seven football and, and it can be a club sport, but if that was possible, at least there's some regulation around it and you're working with your school team. And I don't know if, if that'll ever happen because of spring sports and all the other, you know, things that they, you know, involve, but I would love to see that. I would love to see that. I think that's an answer to a lot of all this, um, craziness <laughs> well uh, pep if they did something like maybe created like right there in june when we get out of school where that time is really because we do a bunch of seven on seven at that time anyway right. and then open up um july um more for uh skill development stuff but mm -hmm. let seven on seven have a unofficial season like you said like they do the female flag football in june let Absolutely. it be dedicated to the whole month of june and host some stuff because if we don't start regulating this stuff, as you start seeing, it's becoming a wild, wild west. Yeah, and um, yeah, you're you're seeing kids having to join this team. And let's let's not undersell this thing. A lot of coaches use this as a recruiting tool. Um, I, I mean, I've had I've lost several players because of seven or seventeen, and that's fine. You know, kids choose where they want to go, but at the same time, that wasn't a tent of doing seven or seven teams. And now you got a lot of um, community coaches or coaches that think they could be high school coaches right. or think they should be on high school staffs, right? Mm -hmm. you, you always got the water boy, right? Well, high school coaches, we got water boys. It's what it is, right? You got guys that want to be on your coaching staff or want to be a high school coach or want to have that um, be looked upon as, as a coach. They're starting to run these programs. Not all of them, because you got some good coaches. I am not poop. Right. right. Um, seven on seven. It's some great guys out there. But I'm just y'all know who I'm talking about. It's coaches out here that's doing these seven on seven teams, and now they're starting to have influence over these kids, even influence on where what high schools they go to, what middle schools they go to. It's so many things like that. But if we could, the state could put more regulations on over it, like I talked about doing something in June where you're actually involving the coaches that's going to be coaching them in the fall. Because yeah. the one the one thing I always see is kids going to learn bad technique. And what I mean bad technique is a lot of, a lot of busy drills. Some of these drills I see out here on uh, social media and pep, that's a conversation for another uh, day, but. Oh yeah. <laughs> kids, kids think, oh, I'm doing this work and this do, doing this footwork and I'm getting tired. Just because you're tired don't mean you're grinding and you're working. Mm -hmm, As mm -hmm. high school coaches, we're able to do drills and we're able to make sure 7 or 7 translate to exactly what we're going to do during the season. A lot of these all-star teams, you, most quarterbacks, you're not going to be thrown to those elite. Of, those receivers aren't going to be elite at your home school. Right. You know what I'm saying? Just what it is. You're not going to have that, that level of talent at your home school. So getting with the kids or the teammates that you're going to be working with in the fall, getting your timing right, and also being coached by the person that actually coaches for you and also has to advocate for you to these college coaches. So, 
I think that's well said. We got a couple comments here. Uh, we got uh, Coach Chris Peavy uh, checking in. He says, uh, talking about the Cam Newton situation, it was deeper than the junk talking. Allegedly, the coaches used to be part of Cam's organization and stole from them. Oh, wow. Well, that once again, that speaks back to what we're talking about, seven-on-seven seven culture, and people that are out here coaching in these seven-on-seven seven tournaments are, that aren't, you know, always qualified to coach. But as, you know, you said, Coach Dub, there are some good uh, coaches out here, coaches that coach on high school teams that are out here with seven-on-seven seven teams as well. Uh, Jamel Lattimore weighing in on about seven on seven says backyard wild wild west disrespect on full display and even encouraged by some and that goes back to what you know we were talking about at the beginning of the show the disrespectful things are the things that go viral and Mm -hmm. kids and adults (laughs) sadly want to go viral so they go and do these you know disrespectful things to get clicks and likes and shares and all those things that um people are driven by in 2024. Um, and and pep i'm gonna tell you something too what we see a lot of is it's the youth mentality youth ball and again mm, yeah all you all you programs aren't bad i'm not talking about all youth program and i don't want to make a blanket statement but a lot of stuff comes out of youth ball and that's the foundation of football. And these kids are being taught the wrong way. Again, you got community coaches that want to coach. They're still doing a great job because some of the best coaches are at the youth level. I'll put that on record. But it's also some bad ones out here. No different than high school is what it mm-hmm. is. But yeah. that's the kid's foundation, right? If you got a bad coach in high school, at least the kid more than likely knows how to play football. But this is their first introduction to football. Not right. just as players, but also as the parents, how you approach the coaches, how you approach the other spectators, how you approach a teammate, all that stuff is being taught. And, and, and it's not a foundational um, uh, level stuff. I remember um, I got one of my good friends coached in the DMV area. They got something called grassroots. Grassroots program is a fundamental program that works exclusively with your middle schools to your high schools. So it's not men trying to move up with their kids. You know how many youth ball coaches you get? Hey, if if you let me coach, I'll bring so-and-so, so-and-so. And I'm like, dude, you ch- you're trying to make a come up off of kids. So you see the same <laughs> thing in seven on seven football, right? Mm, yeah. Those guys, wanna, they want to get influence over these kids so they can position themselves versus doing what we should be in the business of is the kids business. If we make it about the kids and take ourselves out of it, you won't see what happened at Cam Newton. Yeah, real good point. Um, And to finish up this segment, I want to talk, and you hit on it, Coach Dub, about player movement on how 7-on-7 now seems to be um, a vessel for player movement because you have some coaches that are connected to programs coaching seven on seven teams and some of these, you know, now I'll I'll say this, there are some seven on seven teams that are actually led by people tied into high school programs and they're they're exclusive for their school. Well, Pat, and that's, that's bring me to my point of earlier. If the state allows high school coaches, because technically we really don't supposed to be a part of it. Right. You right. get what I'm saying? And you do got coaches that do float mm-hmm. that line or whatever. Yeah. But at the same time, and unfortunately for me, I'm in outdoor track season, so I don't even see a lot of it, but mm-hmm. I hear a lot of it. And yeah. what you see is you see coaches working behind the scenes. The state needs to allow us during those times to be able to work with our players so we can actually teach them what we're going to do. Because what it does, Pep, it makes the game safer as well right? because the little bit of time that we do have with them, we don't really get a lot of time with them. But if a kid, instead of having these all-star teams, let's, let's have school teams. Seven yeah, seven. absolutely. And that's where we talk about that regulation. You know, it would be nice to, to get it at least, or, or just, you know, from a club perspective um, to finish up this segment, Derek Howell commenting, all of this just highlights how well Myron Bell ran NC elite seven on seven. 
organization was ran with class and the players held to high standards and the players treated tournaments like business trips. Yeah, I shouted out um, NC Elite because that was kind of the start of 7-on-7 seven seven here um, in the 704 Charlotte area. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in on that 7-on-7 seven seven talk. Um, I'm sure we'll bring that back <laughs> a couple more times because it's such a uh, such a big deal. But um, when we come back, we will continue more discussion here on Football Focus Weekly with CFI. Now, we're going to switch topics. <laughs> If you didn't know, this is actually a radio show that we do every week now. We're nationally syndicated. Uh, we film it live um, and let everybody comment, but that's what that's what we're doing. Uh, if you if you didn't watch last week, last week was the first radio show, and that will be aired Thursday at three o'clock, and we'll have more details uh, about how you can listen in uh, to the live show that will be aired nationally. I like saying that nationally. Yeah. It nice. sounds good. Got a good ring to it. Yeah, it sounds good, man. <laughs> but we're going to jump now into recruiting. We talked about recruiting last week. Um, got a little passionate. A lot of um, good stuff came out of that. But um, this week, we're going to talk about what's the best way to get recruited in 2024. We've got so many things going on with college football, the transfer portal with NIL, which we're going to talk about later in the show. Um, but getting recruited now, it, it's a challenge. It is a real challenge for high school players. Um, we talked about 2024, um, how that class has been. Um, it's been so hard for them to get all of the um, offers and commitments that um, they should be getting, in all honesty. There are a lot of talented players out there that are still – uh, without home, uh, sadly. I mean, we've got 2024s um, still committing right now. It's a couple that tagged me today in their commitments. Um, but wh- how? What can what can players do? I mean, for 2024 now, it's real late in the process. So uh, we're really looking at 2025 and going forward. And we're kind of we're gonna break this down kind of like those classes. So. Coach Dub, 2025, if you're a 2025 player or a 2025 parent, what should you be doing right now to give yourself the best chance to get recruited? Okay, the first thing um, it starts with, because I always get players asking, hey, coach, how can I get recruited? How can I get seen by college coaches? The number one thing is, it's the secret to the sauce, get seen by your high school coach first, right? You want to be able to be exactly who you say you are or who your coach says you are. Um, the second thing, too, if you're interested in getting recruited, first, be realistic about who you are and where you are in your recruitment. If you're a, a five six running back, 150, 60 pounds, you probably won't be going to Chapel Hill. It's just what it is. And um, I know a lot of people might say, hey, coach, I always dreamed about going D1. Well, that dream is over, fellas. you got to start looking at what's realistic because right now with the transfer portal, it's not a realistic option to even look at those schools unless you're some five-star kid that can run a 4 2 4 3, 40. And trust me, I'm a track coach. A lot of kids ain't running. There's, there's no kids out here running a 4 3. I don't care what anyone says in a 40. But uh, one of the things you want to start off with doing is coming up with a list. List 10 schools each level, or better yet, list five schools per level. Shoot your D1, shoot your D2, shoot your D3. Then also put some NAIA programs up there. So you're going to put five schools that you want to target. Then you're going to go to their website. And this is key. You're going to go to their website and you're going to look up a prospect questionnaire. Your prospect questionnaire should be located on any any college that's credible website. You should be able to find a prospect questionnaire. And what you want to do is you want to fill those prospect questionnaires out. And what that does, it gets you in their database. And, and, yeah, you'll get some generic mail and all that stuff, but it gets you in their database. So when they come and stop by in the spring, they might come by your high school. Some coaches have a list. Some college coaches have a list. Say, hey, coach, we got these 10 players that popped up on our radar. It's not necessarily that they watch the film, but you could have been in their database. And they're just asking the high school coach to 
give them more information about you, such as transcripts, um, character references, um, kind of talk about your abilities and different things like that. So definitely fill out prospect questionnaires. You can go on uh, any website uh, and get those prospect questionnaires. The next step to that is uh, they're going to come by, do spring evaluation, come by and check out your coach or whatever the case may be. If your coach don't bring you up, don't feel bad about it, guys. The ball is in your court. Remember, you control the keys to your own destiny. No coach does. What you could do is start mapping out your your uh, college uh, football uh, camp tour or camp schedule. This is a real thing. And make sure you set your camp schedule up around what you do as a, as a high school. I've seen kids skip out of high school workouts and go to a camp and actually hurt themselves with college coaches. Because the college coaches are looking like, why aren't you with your team? It's a it's a ton of camps, and mainly target your mega camp. And what I mean by your mega camps, UNC Charlotte does a um, a good mega camp, or at least they did, or they used to with the old staff, where you got multiple schools at a camp. Something like what we what what was done with CFI, where you got multiple colleges. So you might go. I seen Mercer had one out, and they had like twenty college coaches. You get more bang for your buck because the more college eyes that you can get on you, the better. So go to the mega camps. And this is the secret to the sauce, fellas. This is the whole thing. Go and show out. Show up and show out. When you go to these camps, wear stuff that stand out like neon socks or special <laughs> different things. Because if you're at a camp, Pep, you know, headbands, different things that's going to make you stand out. Because I'm telling you. I worked college camps before, back in the day when high school coaches could work college camps. Um, I've worked CFI camp, just different things like that. I've stood beside college coaches as they was evaluating people at camp. And the thing is, people can get lost in the sauce. Because remember, if you go into like a, a camp, you got 300 kids at camp, right? Stand out. Sometimes we, we can't watch every kid, but do something to stand out. And most importantly, if you're that dude, show up and show out. Hey, that's that's great. That's great advice. Um, comments, Omar Porter, who does a great job um, helping kids in this area. Um, recruiting is a real challenge and changing daily. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and then being realistic with players is a major problem. You know, I'll, I'll speak to that because this kind of goes into what we were talking about last week with um, recruiting and the offers on, you know, committable offers versus non-committable offers. Um, and then some of these kids getting those uh, D1 non-committables and thinking they're on a D1 level. And then it places them out of D1 and D2 at the same time. And then, you know, you're sitting here late February, almost March, and you don't have nothing on the board um, because you're not real with yourself or no, or someone's not real with them, you know. Um, with camps... Yes, yeah, CFI, us, Charlotte Football Insiders, uh, we do camps with college coaches. We will have a spring camp. Uh, typically, it's announced by now, but we are having a um, we're having a, a logistical issue. That's <laughs> the best way I can put it. Um, once we get um, our location set, then we'll announce it. But we are having a camp in May, um, like we always do. And we'll have college coaches there. Um, I totally agree with Coach Dub. You got to go to camps with college coaches. Um, there are a lot of entities out here that will run camps, um, and they offer exposure, or they may uh, give you um, some free stuff if you're a top performer or something like that. But at the end of the day, what does that do for you? You are promoting their brand. That's what happens with that. And I advise, you know, a lot of kids um, that were getting invites from certain uh, camp promoters and they didn't have college coaches there, but they just wanted to, to have those kids there to say, OK, we got this kid, this kid and this kid. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's not what you want. You you're going to camps for you. You're not going to help their brand. CFI. The one thing I, I, I pride myself on with CFI is we want to be the place where we give you that opportunity to get on the stage. You know, we love everybody, the star players uh, to the, the five, six, 130 guys that are still developing. 
But we want to provide an opportunity for kids to to step out and get their first offer or to get on a um, recruiting board to have the opportunity to actually talk with college coaches because you don't get that everywhere. And we try to do it right before the summer camp season starts because when you go to college camps, that's where you can make your money. So pe- go ahead, Coach. Go ahead, Coach. I wanted to add this because it's so much – ignorant information out there about camps you got to know what you're getting out of camps and the one thing that i heard last year about cfi we had a bunch of kids that didn't want to come i it's six of them now, i'm not gonna call them out they're in my inbox right now they're not signed anywhere but they was too big to come to cfi because what they don't realize power five schools can't come to these camps at right. all yes. if they could we'll have them there y'all know better we, we'll have them there and let but, me say let me say something on that because this is where, you know, I don't I don't do a ton of self-promotion, but you go back and think about who we've had on the show. We had Mac Brown. We had Cut Cliff when he was at Duke. We had um, the assistant head coach from Penn State. We had a um, coach from Wake Forest. Um, and we did a whole series with those coaches. And that, that just doesn't happen by chance. Mm-mm. You know, so I I say that to say there are connections and there are people that reach out to us and ask about top performers at every camp that we have. Mm-hmm. And, 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 Pep, and, and Pep, if I, I needed a, if I needed to show receipts, I could, but I'm not that kind of guy. But I just had to say that. <laughs> well, 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 Pep. Matter of fact, I had a Power Five school come by and ask me about a kid that was at the camp that won MVP. And I was like, that ain't one of my kids. But he actually said, while wow, she was out there, what did you think? We're close to offering this kid. But I want to get someone outside his head coach's opinion. I, and I told him, you know, what he did. And then probably like two days later, I seen that the kid tweeted out he had an offer. But he never knew that it was actually right. based on what he did at the camp. Yeah. So, again, you just got to get smart. CFI, mm-hmm. the CFI camp is no more. And yeah, we rep in CFI, but we rep in the brand because we know it's a good product. And what I mean by that is CFI is equivalent of having being a mega camp, right? You got your D2 schools out there. You got your D3 schools. You got your HBCUs out there. That's like going to a mega camp because the more eyes you can put on your talent, if you're that dude, the more eyes you want on you because that means you're going to get offered. If you got them eyes on you because you get some kids, well, I didn't get an offer. Well, you might not be that the person that people are telling you you are like coach Omar said, you got to be realistic about your skill set. Yeah. And I want to add mm-hmm. something else to what I said earlier, Pep, mm-hmm. when you go into these camps, make sure you're communicating with your high school coach. Make yeah. sure you communicate yeah. with your yeah, high school absolutely. coach. If you're going to these camps and, and just say a coach comes up and talk to you and give you, give you their card, instantly take a picture of that and send it to your head coach and say, Hey coach, or uh, your recruiting coordinator, like uh, Coach Hawk is over at Chambers. Hey, Coach Hawk, um, the coach from school A, just they said this about me. They like me. Um, I did X, Y, Z. You know why? Because that's who they're going to come with. If they truly like you, they're going to come back around in the fall and talk to your high school head coach. So make sure you're um, talking to your high school head coach or assistant coach that handles recruiting. Absolutely. Um, a couple minutes left in this segment. We don't, I'm going to shift and talk about social media usage and putting together a good highlight film. I do a lot of writing for PrepRedZone.com uh, in North Carolina. And one of the things that we do, uh, me and Ed Brooks, Ed Brooks kind of covers the um, Raleigh area and I do Charlotte and then Metro and then I'll we both will focus on across the state but we focus on highlight film we look at film get our evaluations and then put those out and give people and players exposure based on highlight film um some of it is based on what we see um especially during the season in person when we're going to games but off season a lot of it's on your film and if your film is not structured the right way. You're not presenting yourself with the best opportunity when college coaches go to your Twitter profile. Number one, have a tr- a Twitter profile. <laughs> it, it's crazy to me that there are some kids that, you know, coaches and 
um, people promote, and I look for them on Twitter, and they don't have a profile. Or they have a profile name that's not searchable by your name. So number one, have a, twi a Twitter profile under your, your real name. Number two, have your highlight film linked on that Twitter profile in their bio or pinned at the top of your profile. And in structuring it, you need to put your best plays first. There was an all um, an offensive player of the year for a conference here locally. His highlights, um, he, he was a receiver. But his highlights started out with him playing safety, like for the first 12 clips. And I'm like, this is offensive player of the year. Why am I seeing his safety stuff? And I finally got to the receiver stuff, and it was great. So I sent him a message, and I said, put your offensive stuff first. You're an offensive player of the year. That's what, you know, someone would want to see, you know? Um, but But once again, Make sure your best plays are first. Make sure that um, your highlights in the first minute capture all that because college coaches are not going to watch more than a minute, maybe even 30 seconds. And it's even better if you don't even put – if you put the huddle link, that's fine. But if you've got a pin tweet with that highlight just in the video where you don't even have to click a link and they can look at it right there on Twitter, that's even better because that saves them time because they are looking at so many prospects in a short period of time, because you got to remember they're coaching college football. <laughs> Recruiting is a part of what they do. I mean, you look at a, a pie chart, it's maybe what through the season, maybe 3% of what they do in the off season. It gets a little bigger, of course, but still the numbers say you got to capture them in the first 30 seconds of that highlight film, because if you don't, you've blown your chance. And unless you're going to a camp where they're, where they're going to be at, um, they're probably not going to look at you anymore. If you don't capture them. And, and um, Pep, go ahead, coach. Also, um, if they can separate it, sometimes if you're a good prospect, make an offensive highlight, make a defensive highlight. You know what I'm saying? Cause you never know, yeah. you know, when they sit down, they might not like you at receiver. They might like you at DB. But give them the opportunity. You don't want them because they're not going to watch past 13 because you did good. They're not going to get the 12 clip. They're going to probably no. watch three to four. <laughs> and if you don't pop on them three and four, they're moving up. All right. Comments here. Let's see. Um, Omar Porter, kids better start respecting the D2 schools because now their rosters are full of D1 portal guys and they are recruiting different. You know, a couple of years ago I said – I told kids at one of our camps, I said, look, your path now to where you want to go is not going to be straight unless you're a top 5% guy. You might have to go to a D2, and you might have to jump in the portal if you perform well and then get to that D1 by going through that D2. I mean, you got to be open-minded, you know, to where your career starts. It's not where you start. It's where you finish. And if you got the drive and you got the talent and the skill, you'll get to where you want to go. But now with the portal being the way it is, it's not going to be linear. It's going to be a crazy curve line in the forest, man. It's going to be crazy. Uh, let's see. Derek Howell talking about Johnson C. Smith said they brought a lot of guys in from the portal. Yeah. Yeah, it's changed. I, I will say Coach Flowers did a great job when he got there. He took, good gracious, how many high school kids? What, 40? <laughs> and I think they took they took a good number this year, too. But, I mean, it's changing now. You know, getting settled and you go in the portal and get what you need. And there it is. All right, we got Brandon Black here, former Harden Ram, defensive line extraordinaire. Indeed. We, we call him the producer. Did you want to yes. weigh in on uh, recruiting to finish this up? Um, I hope the uh, the sentiment is getting around that there is. I know, you know, kids watch TV. They watch games. They see, you know, the Alabamas, the Florida States, the Michigans of the world. And, you know, a lot of guys have aspirations to go there. And that's absolutely okay. Like I always say, if you want to hit the moon, aim for the stars. So, but keep in mind, just guys – Anyone that hears this, there is absolutely no shame and nothing not to be proud of by getting a D2 offer and going to play D2 football and graduating from college without student loans. 
absolutely no shame in that. Let's put, oh, let's, put an adult, let's put an adult spin on that. Absolutely no shame in that. So, you know, um, you can really feel proud about that. And, and you know, let's, let's kind of lean back on the D1 or bust mentality. And, and also realize that you mentioned the top 5% guys, unless you're one of them, please understand how much of your own involvement, kids and parents that you have to put in to being recruited. Only the upper echelon elites can just sit back and watch the, the offers roll in. Other than that, you got to put in the work yourself for colleges to offer you. They need to know you exist. So keep that sentiment, sentiment. make sure schools know you exist. Well said right there. Coach Doug, we got the last word here. All right, last word. This this is going out to my high school coaches. Help help these kids out too. So if you know you got a kid that might be playing defensive end for you, um, and I'm just using a position, um, might be playing defensive end for you in high school and they're a little undersized for that position, but they're really good for your team and they help you win. If you're up by – in this third, fourth quarter, you're up by a bunch of points, Go ahead and put them at linebacker. Put them at the position that the coaches are recruiting them at so they can actually get film at that position. Chris Hawk is up here, and he knows. He mentioned the kid, Marcus Graham. Same way. Uh, kid was a phenomenal quarterback. Mom was like, he's a quarterback, but we got him film at receiver. We we also coached him at DB. So when the college coaches came, they also had wide receiver film of, of him, and he ended up going to Stanford at wide receiver, not quarterback. Mm, great point right there. All right. That takes us to our next break. When we come back, we're going to continue the discussion on Football Focus Weekly with CFI. It'll be Pep Man's, that's me, 2025 top five wide receivers in the Charlotte metro area. All right. We'll be right back. All right. So now – I'm going to talk for a minute. <laughs> and once again, if you're just tuning in and wondering what we're doing, we have a nationally syndicated radio show now. We made that announcement last week on the show that, uh, when we came back. Um, it'll air Thursdays at 3 o'clock, 3 p.m., I should say. Uh, there will be a post that I post um, probably Thursday morning on how to listen in uh, to the show, but it'll be primarily two ways on the uh, TuneIn app and the uh, Apple Music app. Um, and then I'll kind of list that out on how to get to it. So um, thank you, Omar Porter. Yeah. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. We got to have you on, man. You, you do a good job. You got a lot of knowledge. We got to have you on the show. All right. But now I'm going to go solo, and we're going to talk about my rankings for the top 2025 wide receivers in the Charlotte metro area. So, as I said, I do a lot of writing with PrepRedZone.com uh, in North Carolina. And one of the things that we're doing right now is a big feature on 2025 kids. And I've been working through um, the offensive positions right now. And I'll do defense probably coming up in the first part of March. Um, but we're looking at film and we're giving exposure to kids um, that are really talented. And I did a, a big write-up on a top. 2025 receivers here i did the city of charlotte and i also did the uh, metro area and this is kind of a combined uh ranking on those two areas so uh number five i've got the quadre currents they call them red out of butler high school uh the quadre was the conference player of the year uh last season i believe offensive conference player i'm checking my notes here uh, but I really love his game. I mean, he had 1,143 all-purpose yards, 649 on receiving, 246 rushing, and 248 punt return yards. Uh, 15 total touchdowns on the season. Um, you know, Coach Brian Hales does a great job of moving him around in that offense. Um, 5'10", 165, great agility, um, really gets an open field. Um, he does some special things with the football in his hands. Uh, he's got an offer from Charlotte. Um, I think he's going to get more interest on his way soon. But uh, he's my number five um, Charlotte Metro area 2025 receiver. At number four, I've got Jeremiah Harrison uh, from Chambers. Um, I tell you, that, that program has put out 
talent for years, it seems, and it continues to just churn like a machine over there. Um, and it, and it, and they do it with you know different head coaches, you know, starting with uh, Aaron Brand going to Glenwood Furby, and um, now they got Coach Brandon Wiggins. Um, but you know, Jeremiah's six foot one eighty. Um, he's a threat in the outside receiver spot, or he can play in the slot. I really like his speed. He's got excellent speed where he can close the cushion on a DB real quick and get on top for big plays down the field. Um, they really like to use them on goes and post routes um, against single coverage. And you put single coverage on them, it's a it's an automatic mismatch. Um, and the, when he gets the ball in his hands, he's strong with the ball in his hands. Um, and he can run through initial contact for um, extra yardage. He's got a lot of recruiting attention. Um, he's got offers right now. Um, his latest offers are from Georgia Southern, Temple, James Madison, Campbell, Troy, and Coastal Carolina, all within the last month. I mean, that's incredible. Uh, when that many schools want you, you're, you're legit. <laughs> Um, so Jeremiah comes in at number four in my uh, top 2025 Charlotte Metro wide receiver rankings. I see some comments. Um, people are agreeing with that. <laughs> That's great. All right. Number three, the top 2025 Charlotte Metro wide receivers in my rankings. And these are based on right now, you know, things change, but I've got Brian Rowe from JM Robinson. You might not have heard the name, even if you follow high school football, consistently here in the area uh, i'll tell you about him 6'1 175 he had a breakout season this past year uh, just under a thousand yards receiving and 16 touchdowns uh he was special teams player of the year in his co- um in his conference um he does some dynamic things and kickoff and punt returns um since this year started these are the schools that have offered him east carolina maryland west virginia temple james madison South Carolina, Duke, and Georgia Southern. That is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Um, when you look at the film, he's dominated at all three levels of the defense. Um, he can really do some things in the quick screen game. He gets up field immediate, immediately, shows great vision and um, agility with the ball in his hands. Um, mid Intermediate passing game, great route discipline, explodes out of his cuts. Uh, he throws a deep ball. He can win in jump ball situations against corners when he's one on one, and he's got the speed to win single coverage against and, and really go in post routes. And all three phases, his hands are extremely strong. He always catches the body away from his body. Um, not he doesn't let it get to his pads. Uh, protects the ball well. Um, really dynamic in open space. That's why Brian Rowe from Jam Robinson's number three in the uh, 2025 Charlotte Metro receiver rankings by Pep Man. That's me. <laughs> All right, number two, I have, they call him Nunu, Arian Concepcion from Chambers. And if you think you've heard that name before, you are correct. He is the brother, uh, Kevin Concepcion, who is now starring at NC State, who also starred at Chambers. Um. 5'10", 170. Um, you think of, <laughs> I like to use the term speed personified because that's what I, when I, when I look at his film, that's the first thing you see. Um, it's just incredible. Uh, recent offers for Arion from Marshall, Troy, Coastal Carolina, and Liberty. He's also got offers from Miami, Campbell, and East Carolina. Um, like I said, he can quickly gain separation against man coverage down the field uh, for big plays and touchdowns. He's effective in, qu- in the quick screen game, shows electric agility and wiggle in short spaces to evade defenders and gain additional yardage. Um, in the short passing game, especially over the middle, he shows no fear. He makes tough catches and gets north and south for uh, maximum yardage. He's a really impressive prospect, um, and I think he's going to get even more recruiting attention. Um, as time goes on. Oh, thank you, Coach Hawk. Coach Hawk says Indiana was his last offer. Yeah, that was probably after I wrote this. <laughs> All right. And then number one in um, Pet Man, that's me, 2025 Charlotte Metro Area wide receiver rankings is Jarrell Boulder from Forest Hills. And once again, some people may not know the name because of where he plays, but 
He's the real deal. Six foot 185. Um, he's been impressive ever since two years ago. He broke out in the summer camp circuit where he was um, doing so well. He was earning like offers every camp he was going to, primarily from ACC schools at that time. Um, his most recent offers include Ole Miss, Temple, Indiana, and Georgia. And Georgia just doesn't offer anybody. <laughs> that should tell you how talented this young man is. Uh, when you look at his film, um, incredible ability to make catches in traffic, um, even in double coverage. Um, excellent ball skills, overall body control and strength. He closes the cushion uh, really quickly, run past, he runs past corners and single coverage on the outside. Uh, Jarrell's not afraid to go over the middle, make catches and gain yardage after the catch. He lines up in the slot, creates mismatch problems for opposing defenses. They really do a great job of scheming them up at Forest Hills. Um, also, 3.3 GPA. Um, he can pretty much go anywhere with that. Um, really talented young man, Jarrell Boulder, number one, and Pet Man's 2025 uh, Charlotte Metro wide receiver rankings. Uh, we'll have more of these rankings coming, um, and as the shows get out, they'll be published on social media, and I'm sure everybody will weigh in with their um, their great opinions. <laughs> But these are fluid. Um, these will be updated um, periodically. I, I I think we'll probably update, or I'll probably update them in the summer, um, based on you know getting out and seeing some action, seven on seven action from teams <laughs> in the summer, not the club seven on sevens. And um, you know, I'll offer my um, opinions on that. Now there are some other wide receivers to watch um, for sure. So. We've got Brian Crowder from Independence, who was a first-team all-conference player last season. Sadat Grant, um, he's gotten offers from Charlotte in Eastern Kentucky, 6'1", 180 at North Mech. Uh, really good player. Does some really good things in the uh, special teams game. Sean Brady from Huff. Um, he's got more offers from Marshall in Eastern Kentucky um, and playing at a program that's known for getting kids uh, to the next level. Um. If you flip over, let's see here. Let's go with uh, Chinwa Ezegbo from Central Cabarrus. Really, really um, great physical, talented kid. 6'3", 190. He's got offers from Charlotte, Elon, and Eastern Kentucky. Also a 3.6 GPA. Um, I really think he's got a great catch radius and long arms with strong hands. Physical prospect receiver. Uh, Jaden Gash from Kings Mountain at 5'10", 175. Um, looks like your prototypical slot receiver on the next level. Um, really runs the slot fade route very well. He had several highlights with that play, and that's a tough route to run in high school. Um, he's, he's done a great job there. Um, and then Dominic Testa from J.M. Robinson. Um, 5'10", 180. Just saw him at our winter showcase. He was the wide receiver MVP. Um, last year he had 68 catches um, for 900 yards and 10 touchdowns. Great, excellent footwork um, with a great release off the line of scrimmage. Um, really, really talented kid. Uh, we've got a comment here from Derek Howell. He says, my sleeper pick for the area is Justice Washington at Mountain Island. Strong hands, excellent ball skills. He does not drop passes. Smaller frame, but plays big. Yep, he put in for um, put in a lot, put up a lot of good numbers last year. We'll let, we'll let Coach uh we'll let Coach Dub talk about Justice here to end this segment. What can you say about Justice Washington? Um, he has a great mother, <laughs> wonderful mother. <laughs> that, well, obviously, people know Justice is my son. Um, <laughs> really, uh, we lost Reg last year, um, fourth game of the season. Um, and he stepped up, played real big, played bigger than his size, caught a bunch of tough passes. We played Charlotte Latin. We wouldn't have won that game without him. He caught two touchdowns, uh, one big fourth down. I think it was fourth and 20. He caught it in the back of the end zone. He took another um, short route to the house, uh, but played real big, um, stepped up uh, with, with losing Reggie. So um, definitely look forward to him in this senior year. All right. Good stuff right there. 
All right, so when we come back on Football Focus Weekly with CFI, we'll continue the discussion. We're going to be talking about college football, NIL, and we're talking about the Carolina Panthers and Brian Burns to finish up the show. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. (laughs) All right, to finish up the show, let's talk about um, college football, NIL. So it's just – it's really out of control. So I, I saw a story on Twitter. And the, the story is this. So college football schools in Tennessee and, and Virginia can communicate with high school recruits and transfer portal players through their respective NIL collectives. So what the NIL collective is, is the group. It's like a booster club, basically. So if that, doesn't that sound crazy? I mean, you would think that's against NCAA violations, right? But they got an injunction against the NCAA to allow this. So in Tennessee and Virginia, how does that affect recruiting in those states? I mean, that's that's in, that's just insane to me. Well, it's going on behind the scenes anyway. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I I agree. Yeah, it is, especially now with you know NIL going on. But to make it legal, I just think it's we're college football is going in the wrong direction. Period. It's going in the wrong direction. I mean, I, I applaud players being able to get, you know, money out of their NIL name, image, and likeness. But once again, kind of similar to seven on seven, we need regulations on this stuff, man. I mean, I, I, I just don't understand how this is allowed to continue the way it is. And I mean, some of the numbers, man, I would tell you right now, if you don't know what players are getting in NIL, Really good players are getting six and seven figure deals to play college football. No, I mean, just think about that. Think about that. Think about they're making more money than some NFL rookies. That's crazy, right? <laughs> Brock Purdy. Brock Purdy yeah. is the quarterback of the Super Bowl team, is getting less money than kids in college right now. So I think it's just one extreme to the other. It was too strict. Where you had guys getting suspended because they accepted a free pizza, but now we might have took it just a little bit too far, and we got to bring it back, kind of meeting in the middle somewhere. What explorees are be are exploiting the exploiters? Because mm-hmm. you got to think about it. College football has had a poor structure. It's no real governing body. Like there, I mean, it's not really a strong structure with with college sports to begin with. Right. Um, let's start there. Even you can see years of going back and forth. Should we have a playoff? Should we have a playoff? Should we go BCS or whatever the case may be? It's always been poor. Um, I'm in, in a mind thinking if it is messed up, I'd rather the players benefit than these coaches because coaches have been doing it for years. Um, um, executives have been doing it for years. These schools have been exploiting these kids for way too long. And I agree with you, uh, uh, producer. We should get in the middle. But if it's anyone that it should lean on the side of benefiting more, it's actually the players. Let them get their bread until I'd rather them get their bread than just the colleges and the coaches getting their bread. Because if you think about it, some of these coaches like Coach Saban, you, have you seen some of these contracts? And I'm not talking about their out the contract of the school. I'm talking about these shoe deals, deals with Nikes and stuff. These guys oh, yeah. are breaking oh, yeah. in tons of money off these talents. And these kids are one injury away. So we talk about the kids that might be making more money than the rookies in the NFL, but they're one injury away. They might as well benefit. Well, I, I'm not against them benefiting, but we've got to put some parameters in place, man, because it's, it's, it's insane. All right, let's talk about Brian Burns. Carolina Panthers. Me and, and the producer are Carolina Panther fans. I know, Coach Dub, you like the the evil empire up in New England. Clam chowder. Thank you. <laughs> Clam chowder. Okay. But Brian Burns, I mean, we turned down two first-round picks, at least from the Rams, to, to trade him last year. And now he's still not signed to a long-term deal. So if you were GM Dan Morgan, do you pay him, trade him, put him on the franchise tag for a year? I don't think he's for look. If you look at his last season, I looked it up during our break. Um, he had eight sacks. 
last year. And he's just, I mean, that's that's his lowest total since his rookie year. So coming off the effort he had and, and the production, he's still really good. But I don't think he warrants the money he's trying to command. They made him a very lucrative offer, and he turned it down already. Personally, mm-hmm. you know, I, I regret they didn't take those two first-round picks. Those would really come in handy right now. Um, <laughs> but, but if it's a, it, based on the production, I mean, I think his expectations are exceeding his production right now. And I'm not saying the talent isn't there. The production ain't there. So, um so I would say, you know, if, if it's possible to tag him and trade him, if somebody's willing to take on that salary, then fine. But no, I'm I'm completely against resigning him right now, especially since he's already mm. um since since he's already turned down a big offer. Just sinking that much money in him would just hurt the team too much. And we're talking about a team that has a lot of holes and a lot of needs. We need to spread that around somewhere. So I just think Based on where the team is right now, no, 100% against resigning him for what he wants, I should say. Of course, I'd love to have him, but the salary he wants would just hurt the team more than it would help right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm with you. I If you heard his comments at the end of the season where he admitted to not playing 100% because he was worried about getting hurt, I mean, Dan Morgan said he wants dogs. That sounds like a scared dog to me. <laughs> and we, we we i i just can't get with that i can't get with giving him 30 million dollars a year is what, which is what he wants you know um so i'm probably trying to if there's a tag and trade possibility i i would explore it. let's Absolutely. trade him, let's let's trade him in new england don't, don't y'all want him mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But but you know what? Oh man, I agree with that. Pep. <laughs> trade a tag and trade him. Get some kind of value out of him. If somebody want one of him, he's a young player, right? Um, he's been productive. Like last year, like um, producer said, he had a somewhat of a down year. Um, eight sacks. So he's not in the snooze at in the NFL. Someone needs that production. I think he would be more of a complimentary piece with maybe a more already established defense. You know, uh, um. Um, line, mm-hmm. give him give him an opportunity to um, to sign him and give him the money he deserves, but trade him and get some value. Yeah, you know, and and this hits on the point where I was getting ready to say right here. So Derek Howell comes in, I'm thinking Luvu and Derek Brown are more important to the absolutely one hundred percent. Plug in that and, middle, and then that energy that Luvu brings, and the, he's very versatile. He can play in coverage. He can blitz. Hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, and both of those guys are up for contract extension possibilities. So um, I would definitely rather spend my money there. And, and when Shaq, that, when Shaq went down, you can basically say when, when Shaq went out basically immediately and Lubu, you basically can say Lubu is the leader of that defense right now. I mean, that energy, they really – he let, he basically – they kind of fed off of him, man. And so I, I completely agree with that. Take care of them, man get something for Burns. But I'm not saying Burns is – he's a phenomenal talent. I don't want that to get, be confused. It's just that we need that cap money more than we need one player right now, unfortunately. We can take mm-hmm. that money and pay for three three quality players elsewhere, three guys at $10 million a year instead of one dude for 30 So I just think Panthers ain't in the position. Maybe there's a contender out there, somebody that is just a few pieces away that thinks they're going to make a run for it. Tag and trade under them. There it is. All right. Make sure you join us next week as we continue our discussion on high school football here in Charlotte and beyond with a little love to the college football arena and the pros in the NFL. I would like to thank Coach Dub Robert Washington and the producer, Brandon Black, for being here with me today. Thanks for tuning in. Continue to check us out every Thursday at 3 p.m. That's when the show airs live on the TuneIn app and the Apple Music app. Make sure you search WDRB Media on those platforms to get us live Thursday at 3 p.m. You've been listening to Football Focus Weekly with CFI hosted by the Pet Man. That's me, Matt Morrow. Have a good week and make sure you keep it locked into the best high school football show in the Carolinas.